Hello, and welcome to the Talent Empowerment Podcast. I am your host, Tom Finn, co-founder and CEO of LegUp. Each week, we journey into the minds of game-changing CEOs, executives, talent development savants, and successful leaders from a variety of industries. We dissect their strategies, explore their career paths, and uncover how they're fostering a people-first culture within their communities. Our mission, our goal, to help you love your job and supercharge your career. So let's get started and dive right in. Hello, my friends. Welcome in to Talent Empowerment. Today, we are learning from Joel Stevenson. Joel, thrilled to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Well, it is great to have you. Uh, I cannot wait to learn from you today. Joel is the CEO of Yesware, a leader in sales productivity software. And before he was at Yesware, he was the general manager and founder of Wayfair's business to business division, which he grew to several hundred million in revenue. Pretty amazing. And before joining Wayfair, he held a variety of sales and marketing roles at Ariba, Innovis, and Verizon. Uh, he was also a consultant for a few years at ZS. Associates. He has an MBA from Yale and studied Chinese at Harvard Beijing Academy. I cannot move on from there without asking the question, uh, what is the Harvard Beijing Academy and, and why did you choose to study Chinese? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a summer program that, uh, that Harvard runs. Um, in, in, uh, one of the professors there started it. Uh, and I like to say that I'm a straight A student at Harvard because that was the only class I ever took there. And uh, I don't know if they grade inflation or whatever, they gave me an A. Um, and the way that came about was in my second year of grad school. Um, I don't know. I've, I've always been a, you know, I, it sort of a failed attempt at German in high school, but never really spoke any other languages. But I've I've always been, I've liked travel and I sort of try to see myself as a global citizen and certainly want to raise the kids more that way. And so I thought, well, here's a good chance. Like, I'll, I'm never going to probably be in an academic setting again. Like, why don't I try to do Chinese? And so I, that was an undergrad class. And I, since I was in grad school, you had to go talk to the professor to convince him to let him in your class. And this guy read me the right. He's like, nah, like you grad students can't hack it. It's too, like, it's too much work. Like, you're not going to do it. Eventually, I convinced him that I would do it. So he lets me in the class. And um, it was, that was the hardest class I had in the two years, like, not even close, uh, the, the toughest. And, uh, but it was great. And, but by the end, um, of my, this is the first year Chinese class. My teacher was like, well, you know, you work pretty hard at this and you're going to lose it all if you don't, you know, do something to, to kind of reinforce it. And he's like, you should do one of these immersion programs. There are a bunch of them. There's Princeton and runs one and you know, there, there are a variety of them. And he's like, well, there's this new one at Harvard. You could, you know, you could go do that. So you have to like record a tape and they let you in. And it, uh, so I, I did that and actually it was, the timing was a little bit, um, interesting and I get to, I thank my wife for this. So the, the day I graduated from Yale, um, our second child was born, uh, on the same day. So like, got, you know, got the diploma and then that night that, you know, we were at the hospital and it was, it was pretty wild. And then basically three days after that, we drove down to Florida where her parents lived. And then I got on a plane and go, went to Beijing for the summer. Um, to study Chinese. So it was, it was, it was really cool and um, great experience and learned a ton. I think I probably would have needed to stay another, you know, three to six months to really get it um, to where I wouldn't lose it. I've basically lost it all now, unfortunately, but um, very much of a mind opening experience. Uh, certainly you understand uh, China and, and the Chinese people much better living there and interacting with them. And, you know, being, you know, people would take pictures with me because I was like one of the only white people and certainly yeah. you know, one of the old, only tall blue eyed white people around. So it was, it was fun. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty entertaining. I've, I've been to Beijing. Uh, I actually did on a grad school trip. Uh, we did, did a project, uh, MBA at USC. And, mm -hmm. uh, part of the graduation requirement is you have to go, depending on which class you're in, you go to Shanghai or you go to Beijing and you do a week and you go to all these different businesses mm -hmm. and you actually interact with the CEOs, senior leaders. They tell you about their perspective of Americans in China and business relations and, the, and that kind of stuff. And it was super interesting. And But I remember the same thing as you, Joel. I remember being uh, on the Great Wall and having people come up to me and just kind of hand sign if they could take a picture. They don't speak English. And they're trying to get you to take a picture with their family. So I'm standing, I'm not that tall. I'm six feet tall, you know, but 
I'm just the only, you know, there's this group of white young people running around. Right. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it was just hilarious, um, uh, to be in that scenario. But what, let me ask you this. Why, why did you think that being a world citizen or understanding different communities and contexts was important to your own kind of leadership development? I, you know, you just see the world, you know, get, it's hard to envision, a, I mean, maybe this will end up happening, but it's hard to envision a world that becomes less connected over time. I think if you look at the broad expanse of history, uh, we're getting more connected versus less connected. Certainly things like the internet um, have massively accelerated that. And, you know, from like a little bit of, yeah, I, I didn't, you know, we didn't, I grew up in kind of a, you know, what you might call a lower middle class family, like my family had never, at least for, had never traveled outside the country, like barely even made it out of the, the state. Um, and so it was never really part of my, uh, you know, part of my upbringing, but I always was, was interested in it. And then as soon as I, you know, started working a little bit of money and started to travel a little bit, my wife had traveled more than I had, like, you know, we got it over to Europe and a bunch of, and all of a sudden it's just sort of like, oh, this is, this is different. And there's this whole wide world out there that's not America. And uh, I, I just remember feeling like, you know, I, I don't want to just be an American, like I'm proud to be an American and, and all that stuff. Like, I just don't want that to, to purely define me. Um, I, I was hoping for something a little bit bigger than that. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, the classic kind of stereotype of, you know, the American cruise ship tourists, like you get off, you know, you go eat somewhere, you buy a trinket and you get back on the boat, like you never figure out anything about the country. Like, I didn't really want, I would not, did not want to be that person. Um, and, you know, through, uh, you know, the experiences like that and, you know, and, and in programs like, you know, the MBA program where you got classmates from all over the world, yep. you know, all of a sudden you just, you know, you just feel a little bit different level of, uh, of connection. And I didn't know if I would ever leverage any of that from a business perspective. I, I had a fork in my career where I basically could have become the China person, which I chose not to take. Um, but I, you know, at least wanted the option. And then, you know, we had <clears throat> later in my career, one of my stops at Wayfair was I ran our UK business. So we moved the whole family to London for a couple of years. And that was, that was incredible. Yep. Um, so what, what was the takeaway from moving to the UK for a couple of years with your kids uh, that you can share? Well, I, you know, they were, they were, you know, smaller at the time. They, they remember a little bit of it. Um, you know, we, I probably didn't set it up ideally as an expat. I, uh, one thing I'll say is that there's, um, we had, we were at the time we're homeschooling our kids. And so we homeschooled them over there, which actually made it super easy to go. But the challenge with that is a lot of that ex expat community comes from the school system. Yes. And so I had a community cause I was leading a, you know, a part of the company and had all these new people that I worked with and we were pretty social and, you know, but my wife didn't necessarily have that. Um, and the kids didn't necessarily have that. And so there was, um, you know, there was an aspect for them, which was a little bit more isolating than the way I drew it up. And I think if, if, if I were to do it again, I might try to devise it in a situation that worked better for everybody than just for me. But that said, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, the, some of the ways that these things work financially are a little bit different over there. We had a great au pair. Um, they ended up actually living in her tiny Spanish town for a month where they were the only people that spoke English other than the mayor. And so they had all these neat experiences. We got, you know, it's easy to travel around Europe when yeah. you're in Europe. So we had a lot of great experiences there. And, um, you know, two years went by in a flash. I think we only, I only feel like I scratched the surface of the UK, you know, from being there for two years, but um, yeah, it was, it was awesome. And I, I hope the kids, you know, they, every now and then they, they talk about it and they remember, you know, sort of bits and pieces of it, but uh you know, I, I hope that it's, it's deep in there somewhere. Well, I'm sure it is. Uh, and I lived in the UK till I was eight and then came to the U S so I did it kind of, kind of opposite. So I think I understand, mm -hmm. um, some, some of this, but the, I think what's really important to listeners here is that you've really taken a global approach to your career and you've taken sort of a, Hey, I'm, yes, I'm a U.S. guy. I grew up, you know, middle-class, but my whole goal was to enhance and open up my mind to what else is going on around in the world. Do you think that's made you a better leader? I think so. I mean, there's, there's just very different perspectives on things. Like if you were to take the, 
you know, sort of the Eastern versus the Western perspective, even on something like, you know, negotiation, like in China, face saving is very important. And that's a key part of the way that you approach certain things. And like, you know, here in Boston, like, we don't care, like, we'll just, you know, swear to your face and call you an idiot. Like, that's cool. Like, that's a, that's a, that's a valid way of negotiating and, uh, and communicating here. No one, you know, no, no one, uh, no one uh, uh, minds it too much. And so I think, yeah, you, you pick up um, different perspectives, different points of view, different ways of doing things. And I think, you know, maybe more than anything, the ability to uh, relate to different people where they are um, and, you know, very quickly try to get to some sort of common ground versus if you're always in sort of the whatever your monoculture is, I think it, it gets to be more difficult to, um, to just relate to people. And, you know, it seems like we've got you know, more issues with that lately in the world, especially with, you know, social media amplifying, you know, the, in many ways, I think the worst of us. So, yeah, I think, I think that's fair. And, and look, I, the reality is we all need to enhance our open-mindedness. We all need to work through understanding each other a little bit more, be a little more kind to other people's cultures and feelings and, uh, and be a little more sensible about the way we communicate. I think that's critical in the path for so many of us as we're, as we're developing ourselves and trying to be better uh, global citizens. Yep. So, so let me ask you a little bit about Yesware. Um, so you came in in this organization, accelerated yourself to the CEO. Tell us about the business. Yeah, Yesware is uh, is a sales productivity tool. So we have uh, an application that um, sits deep inside the inbox and helps you figure out things like who's opening your emails, helps you take series of communications and structure them together for uh, for structured outreach. We'll do things like take all of that information that you're generating in your inbox and we'll passively sync it back into Salesforce if you're a, if you're a Salesforce uh, a CRM customer. So generally speaking, what we're doing is we're saving salespeople time and we're giving them information that they need to sell a little bit smarter, whether it's who's inter- interacting with your content or what types of content works better. Uh, and so we, you know, we're generally speaking used by, uh, you know, uh, the most of our customers are tech sales people, but we've got all sorts of people that are in a sales orientation, entrepreneurs, sometimes people use it to job hunt, um, all kinds of stuff. Interesting. So when you, when you started there, you had had a career, you did some consulting, but you had a pretty deep career in sales and distribution and revenue development and those types of things. And when you made the leap, it looks like you came over in a kind of similar sales leadership role, how, how does one go from kind of a sales career um, to jumping into executive leadership? Because there's a lot of people mm-hmm. that are that are in verticals, marketing, sales, technology, whatever it is, uh, accounting, finance, and they want to make the jump from a practical uh, role to a leadership role. How did you do that? Yeah. Yeah, there are a couple of things that I think were the ended up working well in my favor. One of the things that worked well in my favor was um, you know, I was sort of coming up in my career. We had the sort of the dot com boom and bust, and then we had nine eleven and we had, you know, sort of the, the Great Recession of two thousand two. And that's the I was out of work for a short period of time. And um I think it was eventually my wife convinced me to go back and get my I thought I was dumb. She convinced me to um, to do it. And, you know, through computer error or whatever, I ended up um, getting accepted to Yale. And I, I used that opportunity to, in some ways, reinvent myself. So I'd always been customer facing to that point. Um, but I was reasonably quantitative. Um, and, but I'd never, you know, and I was a finance major for a while in my undergrad before I switched it. Um, but I sort of felt like there was an opportunity for me to go back and, uh, and, and, re- and I think MBAs are really great for that. And, and I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not necessarily a, an advocate or, or a, you know, for or against um, MBAs. I think they're right for some people in certain times. But I think when, if you're trying to do a, a career switch or a reimagination of who you are, MBAs can be great for that. So, so I did that. I got a finance concentration. Then I came out and worked for ZS Associates, which is a sales consulting firm, but very quantitative. It's mostly engineers that work there. Um, and they go into, you know, sort of famous for going into massive pharma companies and figuring out how big their sales force should be and what it should look like and who they should talk to and what drugs should you talk about first. So they're very, uh, you know, how do you maximize the, the potential of all these different territories? Um, started by a couple of Northwestern professors years ago. So, um, so that was great. So that kind of gave me an opportunity to then be a practitioner of those things where, you know, I was like, I had to build gnarly spreadsheets and all that stuff and, and explain these things to, to customers. 
then I, I, I sort of just got bit by the startup bug again and got back into um, uh, startup life. The first one didn't work so well. That eventually brought me to to, see, to what was at the time CSN stores, which later became Wayfair, which we can talk more about. But yeah, at Wayfair, I had a chance to do a lot of different things. But I think probably the, the biggest thing that prepared me for senior management was just doing stuff, you know, and the ability to actually go and make a difference in a business. And so I had the customer facing skills, I had the quantitative skills, but then I had, I had, it was able to prove the execution skills of going and, you know, making, you know, scaling a business or bringing an idea into the world or any of those things. And that, that was really what made it possible for me to make the transition to CEO. And when I joined it, yes, where the plan all along was that I was going to be the CEO. Nobody, nobody knew that other than me and the founder, original founder of the company. But that was our that was our plan if a, a few set of conditions happened, which they, they ultimately did. And then I ended up taking over. Yeah, I love the way you talk about your career because you're you're right on that you had a particular set of skills uh, in customer facing roles. And then you had to go learn quantitative skills, uh, which I think is really, really important, which what you didn't mention is I imagine during your your time as a consultant, you had to learn some pretty deep communication skills, some candor, right? Way to deliver information um, that may not be appetizing for somebody that you're you're delivering it to, right? That That is a particular skill in and of itself, that communication piece. D- did you notice yourself actively working on your communication style as well? I suppose a little bit. I, I, I think I... I benefit from the fact that um, early on in like even in my high school and stuff like I was pretty involved in performance art so I was I did acting I was in a you know the glee club and the show choir and I was in the glee club and in college and played sports and so I was I've always there was always a little bit of like being in front of people and um in many ways, I made up for my my academic laziness by being pretty good verbally um, in many cases. So um, I, that was something that was always a little, in, in many ways, became a crutch for me. Um, and in the the consult, it, that works pretty well in sales. Um, oftentimes, you know, depending on what you're selling, but in consulting, it doesn't necessarily work as well, where it's like in consulting, oftentimes the numbers have to do the talking and then the story that you tell with those numbers um, to, you know, perhaps convince a client to do something or help them come to some realization or, or some conclusion. That's a, that is a different style of communication. And so that, that took, um, I think probably the biggest difference there was uh, the realization that preparation is is critical to the to the uh um, to the communication and really like the best salespeople actually prepare very very well like i didn't you know i i didn't i don't i would say i was not best in class at that when i was doing it but you know it's very difficult to show up to uh, a client presentation and consulting without really understanding the data and the numbers and being able to to express those clearly so it's like the the prep aspect of that i found to be you know it was very difficult to fake it yeah, that's a key takeaway for everybody that's listening. Uh, you got to be prepared. You've got to know your numbers. You've got to show up with a communication strategy that's been outlined and you feel confident about. That's the other part. If you don't have confidence in what you're saying and you don't actually believe it, it will come across that way. So you've got to really be confident that you've got the numbers right. You got the plan, the strategy, the tactics, and you can execute. Whether you're a consultant or or you're a salesperson, uh, or you're in marketing trying to grow your career. It really doesn't matter. You have to go through the same pre-work uh, before you show up to a meeting. Um, what did you do when when you were growing the organization and you saw people that weren't prepared? I, I you know, this one's hard for leaders. When somebody comes into your room, they've been invited into your leadership meetings, whatever it might be, and they are just not prepared. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I don't think, you know, I would like to think of myself as not that much of a confrontational leader. And so like, I'm not, I'm not necessarily the one that's going to call somebody out in the middle of the meeting and say like, hey, you're not prepared. Um, I try to be the one that, you know, maybe after the fact would try to debrief with somebody to say like, hey, that didn't go so well. You know, like, why do you think it didn't go so well? More of a, in sort of a Socratic method um, type of way versus a like, you're a, you're a, you know, an asshole or, you know, whatever. Um, so, uh, I, I think that that's been effective over time. Um, you know, oftentimes 
you know, at least in, in sort of an executive team setting, I find that even more so than the than the CEO, it's like the the other executives and what their expectations are, and the and the uh, you know sort of the culture and the and the the way the team operates. That oftentimes that stuff gets kind of self policed. You know, you get a bunch of people that are ambitious and want to do well and are are trying to get better. And the the culture that emerges is one of like, well, I don't want to, you know, not only do I not want to look bad in front of the CEO, but I don't want to look bad in front of my peers either. And I know that if I show up not prepared, like someone's going to call me on it um, or I'm going to or someone will ask me a question that I can't answer effectively. And it'll be obvious to everybody in the room what just happened. So we we didn't I I think I've been mostly fortunate in my career to not have to deal with that a whole lot. But I think much of it ended up being more the culture um, creating the conditions for that versus sort of me personally. So how do you create a culture that has those type of conditions where uh, people are not being called out in meetings, where people feel empowered to do good work, where they are focused on the other peers and making sure that they're delivering for their coworkers, not just the CEO. How do you create a culture like that? Well, hopefully you first, you, you model the right behaviors yourself. And so, you know, ideally you're, you know, you're meeting people where you are, like you're, you know, hopefully you're the one that's working the hardest in the company or close to the hardest. And people can say, I mean, there's sometimes that can be, there's a, the sort of that stereotype of the pace setter leader, which can burn everybody out and, and maybe as can be, can be not helpful, but in general, hopefully you're, you're modeling the right behaviors for the company. And, um, you know, I, I have often found that the people that end up being the best, it's, it's actually not that different than sales. It's like the, the people that end up being the best sales people are often the ones that are the most curious and ask the best questions. It's not necessarily the ones that are the most pushy. And I find that the same is often true in management where the, the people that end up, and I've had a lot of first time managers that have worked for me over the years. And oftentimes you get the people are nervous about it and they're like, oh, I'm going to be a bad manager or whatever. And it's like, well, like, I'm pretty sure that you care about people and like you're generally interested in this person and helping them because that's the kind of person that you are. And so like, I'm not worried about you being a bad manager because, you know, you actually care and you're smart and you're going to ask the right questions and you, you know, you've gotten to this position because you've worked hard and you're good. So, you know, and, and that, that, it doesn't always work that way, but I think often, um, you know, the, if, if you're promoting the people that are generally interested in other people and helping other people, that that's going to be a natural, uh, that's going to be a natural byproduct of it. And, um, you know, and, and that, that doesn't mean you're not confronting Peter. You're not sort of saying like, Hey, you got to do better here. Like, you know, our expectation was here and you met us here. Like, but that's also part of the process of, of caring about somebody. And if you, if you can start from a place of like, well, the, you're judging the action, not the person, you know, so what's the, uh, the old saying of like, you know, be, be tough on the results or the actions, not the person. Like, I think you, you do that enough times and people start to get the idea like, okay, well that, that's kind of how we operate here. Yeah. Look, that is so well said. I think we can play that clip back for people over and over and over again. And here's, here's how you sum that up. You look at the action, not the person, and you try to be human in everything you do as a new manager or as a manager that's been in the job for 20 or 30 years, you have to look at the actions, not the person, don't make it personal and try to develop people along the way. If they miss something, help them, help them figure out why they missed it and how they missed it and what the process was and how we can not miss it in the future. And I think those types of behaviors start to create a really amazing culture where everybody feels valued, their voice is heard, they're, they're allowed to make mistakes, and then you rally around them to support them through their career. That's just the best way to operate a business. Yeah. And I think, you know, one, one, I mean, ex, an experience that I had early at, as a manager that I think many people go through is it's like, you know, cause everything has a yin and a yang. And, you know, I think if you tend to be, you know, on the nicer side of culture, oftentimes you maybe aren't as direct with people or you don't give them the feedback they need. And like the, you know, you really only have to go, hopefully you only have to go through the experience once where you end up having to let somebody go and they're shocked you know, and there's one or two reasons they're shocked. One reason is maybe they're just not self-aware and they were just weren't listening or paying attention. But the other reason is like you screwed up as a manager and you were not clear with them and you didn't tell them the things that they needed to know. And that's on you. And you should feel bad about that. <laughs> like the first time that happened to me, I felt very badly about it. And I resolved that that would not happen again. And, um, you know, it's no one's perfect. And we, 
you know, we have our, our, our good days and our bad days, but in general, um, you know, it, it normally only takes one of those. If you're, if you're really kind of a, a self-conscious person to, to realize that you got to do better. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. You have to be honest, non-confrontational, but honest with people about their performance in a private setting where you can say, Hey, here's what I see. And here's, here's how we can work on it. And how do you feel right. And get their feedback on what's going on in their lives. So many times I, when I saw, saw poor performance, uh, in my career in corporate roles, it was related to something outside of the job or some sticking point inside the job that they just didn't know how to deal with. And they just needed a little help uh, to get over that that kind of sticking point that was holding them back. So I think if you just listen, be empathetic, and and try to understand people along the way, you can really get through those difficult conversations. I want to I want to turn our attention to um, something that was in your introduction, which which I found fascinating, and it's this idea that uh, Joel, you you went to Wayfair and you really started the business to business division. So can you talk a little bit about sort of what you did and how you started an entire division in a large company and what that looks and feels like? Yeah, it, it's a, it, I think it's a fun story. Uh, hopefully other people think it is, but it's, it, you know, like many of these things that sort of happened by accident where, um, at the time, we were this company called CSN Stores. We had all these micro sites, so we had hundreds of these sites that were SEO, you know, search engine optimized. So, you know, think of things like, uh, you know, luggage.com and cookware.com. And we had uh, there was one site called allroosterdecor.com that all it sold was rooster decor. It's hard to believe that that was a real website. So, and I was responsible for twenty or thirty of them that had to do with, uh, you know, renovation, home improvements, so lighting, and plumbing, and tools, that that type of stuff. And um, in those days, the you know, we the company was a lot smaller, and so we would get ca- carbon copied on all the order confirmation emails that would go out to customers. And you know, occasionally I would sort of look through them, and you'd start to see some patterns emerge, like oh, electrician shows up again, or designer, or this or that. And um, and and we had a, a couple of folks that that were working for me at a bit of the company for a while that also had some of the same instincts that that it you know that it indicated to me like hey, this might there might be something here, and so. Um, I had a B2B background. And so these, these, some of these patterns look pretty familiar to me, whereas most of the company was B2C e-commerce. It wasn't a thing that, um, that, that folks spent as much time sort of thinking about. And so what we, what I ended up doing was basically convincing the guy that was running the customer service organization to give me a couple of his reps. And then we just started cold calling people with the, with the idea that, well, if we could convince these customers to just call a rep, we would give them better service, we'd give them better pricing. Would that then lead to, better long-term revenue and profit for the company. And so we, we started with that. It was a complete disaster. Uh, we, we just made call after call, got hung up on like, what? Like it, it, it did not go well in the early days, but eventually, you know, we, we started to figure some things out. We, we lucked out, um, this woman joined the company who understood that business and we ended up uh, a recruiter knew what we were sort of doing. And it was like, Hey, Joel, I think you might want to, you know, pull this person into your group that's trying this thing. So we pulled her in um, Katie and she, and she like, she, all of a sudden the world changed because like she knew what she was doing. We started winning deals and then it started to look real. Uh, and so we, we then sort of went to this, this idea, like I was convinced I'm like, Oh, this is going to be great. Like, I'm going to go, like, we're going to go do this for real. And I'm going to convince everybody this is a great idea. Well, you know, so I, I convinced my boss and uh, my boss reported to Nourage, the CEO. And so we're, we're going through this thing and, um, he's like, I'm going to talk to him. And, and so he goes and he talks to him and Nourage is like, well, the only thing you've succeeded in doing is proving that you can take money out of one pocket and put it into another. It was sort of the big idea. It was like, we sort of are intercepting customers that have already been acquired and like, maybe we're doing it better. Maybe we're not, but it wasn't that, wasn't that clear. It's like, well, you know, go back and, you know, I don't believe it, but you know, you're welcome to try to prove it. So we went back and we spent more time. We sort of figure some more stuff. And then like, I thought we had proven it. We've made another run. We sort of didn't get approval. But then finally, after, you know, months and I don't know, probably 20 different ways looking at the data, we finally had a view that was incontrovertible that this was working and this was generating net profit for the company. And so then we finally got the approval to start to spin it up. And so we hired some more people. We started to put, we had no budget, of course. So I had to like bribe an IT guy to install the CRM and we did it under cover of darkness and all this stuff. But, you know, we we started to grow and it it started to work and, and it was a real business. And so then we, that was at the point at which Wayfair consolidated all these 
these little websites into Wayfair.com. And I, that was when the, the opportunity in the UK also opened. So I, I sort of gave this up, in, which was sort of a side project anyway. I went to run the UK business for a couple of years came back and, and ran our financial planning group while we were going public. But then this this thing just kept growing and growing and growing. But it sort of had gotten sprawled throughout the organization. And at this point, it was probably about a $100 million part of the business, but didn't really necessarily have strategic direction. And it, was the, it wasn't really clear what we were doing. So fortunately, one of our investors said something like, hey, I think we should have a GM for this group. And I caught wind of it. And I was like, well, if there's going to be a GM for this group, it should be me. Like, I felt like I, I have earned that opportunity. And I've been, by the way, I'm terrible at FP&A and I'm never going to be a CFO. I hit to, and so please get me out of this group. Um, so it was a little bit of like running away from the current job and running to a, to a new one. But, the, but anyway, so they, they let me have this job. And so we, we kind of set a new strategic direction for what we were doing. We had way more resources. We started to hire a lot and, you know, we were just able to through, you know, through a process of, you know, uh, systems and sales productivity and strategy and technology, uh, and, and some pretty good vertical targeting, some really good, um, work on, uh, a paid search advertising side. We grew this thing, you know, from a hundred to 400 in like, you know, two years. And now it's, I think it's, you know, approaching two or plus 2 billion, um, actually. So it's like, it actually worked. Wow. That is a great story. You started with, this is a great story and it is a great story. The word that I kind of think of is entrepreneur. You, you almost act like an entrepreneur inside a large organization. Did you feel like that was some of the behavior that you were taking on through this process? Yeah, for sure. And it, 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 mir- it, you know, having now been a venture back CEO, it mirrors that process a lot where it's like, you got to sort of prove it out before anybody's willing to give you any resources, you get a little bit of resources, you got to prove it out a little bit more. And then eventually you get to some point where it's proven out enough that you've got to go scale it. And that requires, you know, a good vision. It requires great execution. It requires an awesome executive team, all that, all that kind of stuff. So I think it, it is, uh, it, it is quite similar in, in that respect. And, um, you know, for me, I had always wanted to start a company, but, uh, you know, circumstances in life were, were such that it didn't really make sense for me to, to do that. And so this was sort of an opportunity for me to, to in some ways, scratch the entrepreneurial itch, but within the, uh, I don't know, you might say the safety of a larger organization where I knew I was going to get a paycheck and benefits and, you know, to, yeah, we had a growing family at that point. So there, there was, a, there were a lot of benefits to that. Whereas like now I'm at a point in my life where I can take more risk and I'm, and I'm starting to do that. Well, I think it's a really important lesson for people that are in large organizations because there's this sense that you can't be entrepreneurial. You, you're stuck. You have to do what the man tells you to do. Uh, and I don't know that that's always the case in organizations. I think organizations for the most part, are looking for some level of innovation from their internal employees. And if you can come up with a great idea that, yes, it, it's going to have to increase revenue and increase profits and not have a huge drain on resources at the same time. That is the magic. It's fair that that's going to come up. But if you can kind of put pen to paper and figure that out, I think people are willing to listen. Do you do you feel that way? Yeah, I'm mean, particularly after being a CEO now, it's like, I think, you know, the thing that you dream for most is you have people within your company that are going to take initiative and figure things out and just advance the ball without you having to tell them what to do, uh, you know, and whether that's, you know, figuring out something new or figuring out an improvement on the thing that you're already doing like that, that's kind of the dream. And there's no, you know, at least of any, um, uh, you know, public or venture backed or, you know, well-funded, you know, private equity backed corporation, there's every CEO has got to sit in front of the board and try to, and, and at some point deliver the message of like, how, here's how we're going to grow X percent this year. And in the next year, here's a three year or five year plan. And, you know, to the extent that things start to emerge inside of your company, that you can start to lean into and invest in that have already been proven out without you having to come up with it all yourself. Like that is the, that is the dream. And so I think, whereas, you know, bigger companies oftentimes can create constraints uh, and uh, stifle innovation, you know, there are some that don't. And I think if you want to do these types of activities inside of a company, the most important thing you can sort of screen for is how does a company treat failure and if the company treats failure in the right way which is like okay you had a good plan you executed it well for whatever reason it didn't work 
that's fine. Like we, in some ways we celebrate that versus like, oh, well, it didn't work. We don't really care why, like you're an idiot. Like that is, that is not a good place to, to be an entrepreneur. But there are, there are many companies, I believe, that have created those conditions and people can do some awesome work. Yeah, I completely agree. And if you are in a company that you are trying to be an entrepreneur and you've built something great and it just didn't work, but you had all your ducks in a row and you brought in the right resources and you you listened, you kept an open mind and it just didn't work out for whatever market conditions or change that happened. It happens. It happens to entrepreneurs all over the world. It happens to entrepreneurs. Uh, it happens to big businesses. Things change and you don't sometimes see it. My recommendation is go find a new place to work. Uh, because if you have that entrepreneurial spirit and you want to get after it and you want to develop, uh, and you're in the wrong culture, it will hold you back and you don't want to stay. And, and I'm not an advocate for job hopping. I'm not an advocate for, uh, you know, not working through some difficult conversations within an organization. I'm the opposite. I want you to work through conversations, but there is a point that you're just in the wrong culture. And that does happen for folks. Um, did you ever feel like you were in the wrong culture, Joel, yourself? Or do you always feel like you, you landed on your feet in the right spots? Well, at, at Wayfair, actually, I mean, part of the thing that emboldened me to to try the the B2B thing was actually like a, a failure from before. So when we had all these microsites, we were trying to figure out like new categories to enter. And um, I had the brilliant, we tended to be good at things that were a little bit less well distributed, that were big and bulky. And so I was like, oh, the perfect thing is obviously caskets. And so we got, we, I convinced the company to go into caskets and I don't forget what the website was called, CSN Death or something like that. I don't know. Um, and so we, we, we stood it up and actually like I, we did a pretty good job. Um, executing and if it, I think feel like if it wasn't for the brand police at Wayfair, like oh well, caskets are off brand for Wayfair. It's like ah, maybe they are, um, but I feel like we we maybe could have made it made it work. But anyway, it was basically a complete disaster, and, uh, and we sold virtually none of them. Um, but the view was that we did a good job. We got into it for the right reasons. We actually executed the plan well, but it didn't it didn't work. And so like the, nothing happened. Uh, every I was the butt of jokes for years and still am. Um, as a part of that, but effectively it was, uh, you know, it was, Hey, like, you know, good, good job trying and like, let's try something else. Well, and now that we know that the brand police got you, it really, uh, had nothing to do with your execution or strategy. It was mostly the brand police, but I bet you learned that you have to think about that. You have to think about the overarching brand of the organization. How does this tie in? How is this going to map for our customers? Is it going to speak to the market the right way? Lots of different businesses we can be in, but it's just got to be on brand and on target. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love it, man. I love what you've done in your career. Um, it sounds like you have really taken every step of your journey and been really thoughtful about what moves you wanted to make. And I think that's an example to all of us that um, you can bob and weave and have some starts and stops, but just always be thoughtful about the direction you're going, how you're treating people, how you're looking at these experiences from a, from a learning standpoint. And it sounds like you've done that. So congratulations, Joel, on, on all of your, your success, uh, you know, through organizations. And then, uh, of course, your, your great success uh, at Yesware and, uh, and the sale of the organization, you know, a, a year ago or so. Congratulations, my friend. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Joel, if, if somebody wanted to get to know you, uh, reach out to you, come work for you, uh, where, where could they hunt you down and find you? Yeah, I mean, best best place is probably LinkedIn at this point. Um, I'd say um, uh, you can you can find me. I think it's uh, Joel Stevenson GM is the is the tag at the end. Um, you can uh, you know you, you could we we do a lot of work at Yesware that I think is helpful to folks that want to understand sales. So we've got a great we've been putting out content for years, um, which you find at Yesware um, forward slash Yesware dot com forward slash blog. And then um, I've got a uh, a podcast that we've been doing for a while on sales topics called the hard sell, which you can find at yesware.com forward slash podcast or the, the normal, the normal places. So there's a few places, a few places to hunt you down. We'll put that all in the show notes, my friend. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you do and uh, appreciate you being on the show with us here at talent empowerment. <laughs>